This week we've talked about the uh, Laodicean message. We've tried to understand better how to prepare for Christ. And this evening I'd like to sort of uh, summarize the ground we've been over <clears throat> with some major points that uh, come from what we've studied and how to go about a meaningful relationship with Christ. But uh, I wish we could sing one more time. I've enjoyed hearing you sing, especially when the parts began coming in on the chorus. <clears throat> I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known. Nor why unworthy Christ in love redeem me for his own. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed. I was tempted to tell you everything that I know about marriage and family this evening. You know, when you talk to a group of singles, that's an overwhelming temptation. <clears throat> and I see a close spiritual relationship between uh, what little I know about that subject and uh, what we've talked about this week. So I'm going to <clears throat> play around with it just a little bit and see how it goes. If it goes well, I will keep going. If it doesn't, we will quit and get into something that I had planned otherwise. <clears throat> Every successful relationship, whether it's with father, mother, brother, sister, husband, wife, or the Lord Jesus himself, is based upon communication. Isn't that true? Communication. And uh, for a long time, I've been trying to, to boil my wedding sermon down to one word. <clears throat> I think that's about all they would remember anyway. Uh, communication. Just shout it out after the candles are lit and uh, everybody's there. <clears throat> communication. And go ahead and tie the knot and be done with it. Now, if we want to expand that just a little, we can expand it vertically, first of all, communication with God, and horizontally, communication with each other. And there you have the whole answer. Now, every uh, successful marriage and family continues the communication. But every problem in marriage and family is the uh, result of a breakdown of communication. And according to all of the studies and the seminars and the books <clears throat> and the lectures and the case histories and the hard knocks, communication in marriage and family breaks down usually at one of six or eight levels. I have a little memory crutch system that I use to try and remember it. It's Mr. X and his two R's. M-R-I-C-C-S and his two R's. <clears throat> Money, religion, in-laws, children, lack of things in common, the sexual side of marriage, roles, and reconciliation. The problem in the area of money looks like an innocent one, but according to some surveys taken in the Midwest of hundreds of couples who indicated problems, 70% of the breakdown of communication was economic. So it's not so innocent as it looks. 
religion. You know, it is possible to be united as far as church membership is concerned and to not have a united home spiritually. Isn't that true? It sure is. That's one of the myths that we've had. To think that just because two people are members of the same church that they're going to have a united home on the spiritual front. That's a myth. It isn't necessarily so at all. Because you can have one person who is only religious and you can have another person who is spiritual and you do not have a united home. Do you follow me between the difference of being religious and being spiritual? People in the days of Christ were very religious. They did not know what it meant to be spiritual. In-laws. What's the problem here? Well, it's obvious. And I'd like to expand on the spiritual side of that in a moment. Children. How does communication break down in this area? Well, of course, first of all, whether or not to have them. Secondly, how to bring them up. Discipline, disagreements, conflict over how to relate to them. Things in common. A very tricky one. Because it is so easy to think that you have everything in common at first. When love is so strong, and to uh, miss the point, to wake up after marriage and realize that you have very little in common. He likes concerts. She's never been able to stand concerts, but now she likes him. And she's found out that she has a new interest. Concerts. That's where it gets tricky. Six months, a year after they're married, find out that uh, you don't change that much just because you got married. She still hates concerts. Isn't that the way it goes? And so to discover how much we really have in common takes some serious study And the happiest marriages are the ones that have the most common interests in common ways. The sexual side of marriage. The Christian philosophy is that sexual compatibility is the result of a happy marriage, not the cause. It's just the opposite from the world who feel that it's the cause. And according to the world, I'm surprised on even some of the advice from some of my own colleagues. If your marriage, your relationship is in trouble, spend more time in that area. I've never seen a a greater demonstration of salvation by works in my life. Sexual compatibility is the result of a happy marriage. Roles. Today we have problems on that. More than we used to. Uh, Who is expected to do what? What is the role? It can vary in relationships, can't it? But there must be a clear understanding of who is doing what and have the lines clearly understood. Sometimes people chip away on this for years before they come to an understanding. And finally, reconciliation. They um, have never understood how to reconcile when there have been differences. Now, I have talked to families, to marriages, where uh, people felt like they were in trouble. And I have followed the practice of going down through these eight points where communication usually breaks down. And as we go down through the list and find out their reaction, we know just how big the trouble is. For instance, if on every one they say, oh, my, that's a disaster, and all eight go that way, why, 
you know that you're in for a long, hard winter. If, on the other hand, no problem there, no problem there, and there any problem there, you come down, I was talking to one couple a while back, you come down to the last one, reconciliation. For 20 years, they had lived together <clears throat> as husband and wife, and uh, were married, and they, in the process, discovered that neither one of them <clears throat> ever knew, evidently in their background, they never knew how to say they were sorry, when there had been problems, difficulties, arguments, disagreements, they simply said nothing. And for 20 years this had been chipping away until love had waned and they had no marriage left. Whatever your method, whatever my method, I must, in order to have a successful relationship, know how to uh, attack the problem of reconciliation when there have been differences. And the happiest is the person who knows how to say, by the grace of God, I goofed. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Isn't that true? Isn't that the biblical approach? <clears throat> well, that's a synopsis. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know personally a whole lot more than the synopsis about this whole business. But I'm intrigued by the spiritual uh, suggestions from this. And having hit, it just hit me today, I haven't had time to work out all the ramifications. I think I'm going to work on it. You might give me some help after this meeting. But uh, let's now take Jesus' own analogy. Jesus was the one that compared marriage and family relationships with relationship with God and with him. He does it more than once, doesn't he? All right? What is the secret of a happy relationship with Jesus Christ? It's communication, isn't it? Of course it is. There is no such thing as relationship without communication. Now, our eternal destiny is not based upon our relationship, but it just so happens that the relationship with Jesus is the way we accept the cross and his finished work for us, isn't it? There's a great deal of talk among some nowadays. Let's just talk about the cross and the finished work of Christ. I, uh, I respect and I honor and I stand in awe at the finished work of Christ at the cross, but it avails me nothing until I accept it. And it avails me nothing until I continue to accept it on a daily basis. Isn't that true? You can talk about righteousness all you want to. But the minute you talk about righteousness by faith, you are including two parties. And the Bible never teaches salvation by grace alone. It is always salvation by grace through faith. And the minute you have the word faith, you have to insist on a relationship between two people. The faith relationship. And that relationship is based on communication. And that's why the uh, daily contact with God, our private life with Jesus, our devotional life, the study of his word and prayer are so significant in the Christian life. Well, now, where does the relationship break down? People when they come to the altar, they are absolutely certain that this is the one, this is final, this is it. You know, except for the shotgun-type marriages, uh, most everyone thinks this is it. <clears throat> We've got the ideal situation. And if they continue to talk as much afterwards as they did before, we'd have a lot more happy relationships, but... Relationship breaks down because communication breaks down. And communication breaks down on these six or eight levels. How does communication with God break down? Money. Let's start with the first one. Money. Luke, the 12th chapter, verse 15. Jesus said it. 
A man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Aren't we, most of us, painfully aware that money and possessions and the mad search for just something more can eat away on a vital relationship with the Lord Jesus. Isn't that true? Jesus had about as much to say on that as most anything else. And so this is an area to be much aware of and not allow to break down a relationship with Jesus. Religion. Religion. In Matthew 23, you have one of the hardest hitting chapters in all the Bible where Jesus got up and he said to these people, Why, you hypocrites. Again and again he called them hypocrites and whited sepulchres and snakes and sons of snakes, he called them. He was striking out at them from everything we know with tears in his voice. But he certainly let them know which way it was up. And the main problem was that they were religious. They were so religious that their religion would not allow them to recognize the Lord Jesus when he came. Isn't that true? You can't ask for more religious people in the world than these people. And what was the problem? What's the main flavor? What's the main idea of this being religious? It's the exterior, the outward, the going through the forms, going through the routine, beating a hard path between the home and the church, and going through this routine week after week. And don't ever change. Don't try to bring something new. Don't try to uh, introduce anything fresh. I've got my routine, my rut deeply formed going through the forms. And if my uh, Christian life deteriorates to going through the forms, through the routine, it isn't long and there's a breakdown of communication. In-laws, what's suggested by this? The relatives. The relatives. Matthew 10, 34 to 37. Very interesting statement. You know, sometimes we think that religion is supposed to bring only peace and joy. Please, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And in the same book, the 19th chapter, verse 29, you have it even more specific. Every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or husband, shall we add, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. We are living in a time, as we noticed when we first began our week, when there is a shaking going on, and people who might have been compatible because they were both lukewarm suddenly discover that there's no more lukewarm. You go either hot or cold. And when one goes hot and the other goes cold, you have a problem, don't you? And this is permeating families today. There's no question about it. And the question, the issue, still faces it faces us as uh, described by Jesus. There is no one, husband, wife, father, mother, daughter, son, more important than the Lord Jesus himself in our life. Have you accepted that and drawn a circle around that? 
Why do people have problems in homes over in-laws? Because they love father and mother more than me, right? If my wife loves father and mother more than me, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I don't know why I have to tell it when she's here, but because <clears throat> I'll get it afterwards. But anyway. It was on our honeymoon, and I thought our marriage was over. <clears throat> I made some dumb remark about her knit dress. I didn't like her knit dress. Well, her mother had knit the dress for her. And when you drive a couple hundred miles with the one looking out the window that way and the other out this way... It gets kind of heavy, you know. She had lived with mother longer than she had with me. Well, we discover in these kind of relationships just how much other people, relatives, are going to have with our relationship have to do with it. And the same thing works with Jesus. <clears throat> I heard my father say a while back, he said, I'm determined that if I'm the only one that should show up in the heavenly country and even if I knew that I would be the only one and none of the rest of my family were there I would want to be there for Jesus' sake oh my, ouch no, that tears you apart at first, but it's right isn't it? it's right I know of people today who are just a little bit unhappy with God and looking over their glasses at God because their children apparently have gone bad and they don't want to go to heaven if their son or daughter isn't there. Well, that sounds at first glance like real love. But it's the wrong stance, isn't it? It's the wrong position to take. On the basis of these texts, and I'd like to encourage them, please, the story isn't over yet. And there have been some magnificent breakthroughs with sons and daughters in recent years. The story isn't over yet. Hang on, keep praying. Isn't that the way to go? Well, now things begin to break down. <laughs> We've already covered, uh, you know, the in-laws and the children, in a sense. In-laws and children. And now I get to things in common. And... Uh, <clears throat> Up to this very moment, you know, coming onto the platform, I'm not sure which text I should use for that one, but anyway. You know, things in common. If I don't have common interests with Jesus, why, well, I would be very uncomfortable living with him forever, wouldn't I? You know, suppose I'm hooked on rock music just to, you know, take the modern scene. <clears throat> that we run into right here on the campus once in a while. I don't understand what's so fascinating about rock music when you've heard the same phrase and the same words over 150 times in a row. Wow, if someone explained that to me. But anyway, it seems to get in the blood. And if a person is hooked on that, and this is his lifestyle, he, he's, he's going to be looking for some of that in heaven, isn't he? Sure. And we know our characters, our desires, our tastes, or anything are going to change when Jesus comes. Have, have you ever considered the fact that it is the evidence of the love of God that he leaves sinners out of heaven, it would be torture to them. He allows them to destroy themselves and to get out of their misery. It's an evidence of his love. I had a preacher friend who preached a sermon, the man who got to heaven by mistake. And someone came late to the church service and they didn't get the preamble, you know, and as a result, well, they went away and said, what a terrible
terrible thing. He's preaching that people are going to be in heaven by mistake. But his whole point was that suppose, just imagine that someone got there by mistake, how miserable they would be. And he went down through the things that would make him miserable. And finally, the first chance that the gates were left open, he would flee. He would flee. Common interests. And if we're not going to change when Jesus comes, it certainly uh, doesn't change us, but fixes our characters for eternity. Then uh, it's very important for lasting and happy relationships to discover things in common with Jesus now. Isn't that so? Common interests with him. And what, what is one of his main common interests that he would like to have us join him in? Reaching out toward others. The uh, sexual side of marriage, uh, not, not so far off. What does that have to do with? It includes what we do with our bodies. And what does Romans have to say about that? Romans, the 12th chapter, you know the, uh, you know the verse. Romans 12, verse 1. How familiar this is. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Here we have the reality that in a vital relationship with God, there can be a breakdown of communication because of unhealthful actions regarding our bodies. It includes the whole gamut. Doesn't it? Eating, drinking, temperance, the whole business. The whole business. And it is true and has been very well defined and pointed out by those who are specializing in the health approach that uh, a relationship with God and communication can certainly be affected here. No question about it. What about roles? Roles. Please, this is big. This is heavy. There has been a great deal of misunderstanding in the Christian life, Christian church, concerning who plays what role between God and I. And that's why you can come into the dilemma that is spoken of in Romans, the seventh chapter. Romans 7, verse 18. To will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Describing the problem of someone who doesn't understand his role, the relationship of divine power and human effort. And the same author wrote about it in Philippians, the second chapter, where uh, he made a very precise statement. He said, work out your own salvation. Verse 12, with fear and trembling. There's something for us to do. We know there's something for us to do in this great scheme of salvation. We have to accept what Jesus has done. And he has done it. We don't try to earn our salvation. We don't try to merit it. But we have to accept it. And not only that, accept it on a continuing basis. And then it says, if we will accept that, God will work in us. God will work in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. I tried to get a book together on that because of the burden concerning this area. Consider it a very, a very important area. Because we are told by the messenger to this church that we will be in constant danger until we understand how to use our will. Are you aware of that? A misunderstanding of the roles can cause a breakdown in relationship with Jesus. Isn't it too bad to waste our time doing what Jesus has already done for us or what Jesus has promised to do for us instead of spending our time and attention doing and seeking what he has not promised to do for us? Oh, someone says, but there's a quotation that says, and, you know, and they reach in their pocket and pull out a few rare unpublished ones. 
There's a quotation that says, God does not propose to do for us either the willing or the doing. That's true. Read the context. God does not propose to do for us either the willing or the doing in seeking Him. He can't. God's never going to seek Himself for us. But He has promised to do the willing and the doing in fighting sin and the devil. There's the big difference. And people have gotten discouraged because they are going into defeat and failure all the time because of a misunderstanding of roles in the relationship. We'll find relief when they discover that there's one thing we can do, we must do, and that God cannot do for us. That is to continue to come to Him. And all the rest of it He's promised to do for us, in us, he doesn't bypass our capacities, but He does them in us. It is God that worketh in you both to will and to do. And finally, uh, reconciliation. Reconciliation. Why, you know, the Bible has something very nice to say on that. Second Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. If any man be in Christ, verse 17, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. What does it mean to be in Christ? In Christ. What does it mean to have Christ in you? You know, this even suggests <clears throat> that most sacred, most intimate union in marriage. It even suggests it. But basically what it means is to be in relationship with someone. To be in communion with someone. To be in fellowship with someone. If we are in fellowship with Jesus, if we are in relationship with Him, we are new creatures. All things are passed away. All things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing our trespasses unto us. And he hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When I feel that I have sinned and cannot pray, that is the time to pray. Away with this idea that when I, because of my behavior and my immaturity, I slipped and fell, and now I have sinned, and I have to wait for two weeks for God to cool off before I come back. Away with it. That can go on forever. Ten days later, you fall again. Now you've got to wait another two weeks. That can go on forever. It was amazing to me to discover that when... Because I'm still a growing Christian, I fall or fail. I don't wait for God to cool off. He's still looking at me with compassion and reconciliation. And I go to Him just as I am. Immediately, I don't wait. I love the picture by Harry Anderson of the man who is kneeling at the feet of Jesus. Jesus is sitting there on that like throne and this man is kneeling there with his head buried in Jesus' lap. You've seen the picture. I've been looking for a big one. What a beautiful scene. Because I've been there. I've been there. I see myself in the picture. Do you? And he's the one that says, we are not apart. We are not separated. Who can separate us from the love of God? From tribulation or distress? No. We continue, and He is the initiator. He is the initiator. Someone gave an interesting talk on family and relationships one day. It was Archie Dart. He said, uh, he asked the people, he said, look, if there have been disagreements, and there have been conflict, there have been problems, and there is a distance. You know, who should be the first one to initiate reconciliation? And they said, the one in the wrong. Of course. No, he said. 
The one in the right. The one in the wrong is emotionally incapable of it. The one in the right always initiates reconciliation. And when we heard that, ever since we heard that, my wife and I have run into each other rushing to initiate reconciliation. <laughs> well, we figure he had a clever plan there when he said that. But the truth is that God is in the right. And he does initiate reconciliation. Isn't that true? He's the one. He has initiated it all. All the way. And he says again and again, come unto me. Come unto me. And I will give you rest. John 6.37 Whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. I believe that text is good for today, tomorrow, and the next day. I believe it's good for you, every one of you. Not just for Jones or Wagner or a few names. It's good for you. Today and tomorrow, Jesus is the great reconciler. And that is what changes our lives when someone accepts you and initiates reconciliation when they are in the right. That breaks your heart, doesn't it? Sure it does. I guess I'll finish with the parable. I uh, <clears throat> was in love with this beautiful girl over 20 years, over 25 years ago. <clears throat> Get that straight. And uh, the day of our wedding came. I traveled north from Los Angeles to San Francisco. And we got up in front of the preacher and we admitted that we did. And he tied the knot and after the wedding was over, she went back home with her folks and I went back to Los Angeles. <clears throat> and uh, two years later, someone said to me, are you married? I said, yes. Well, we've never seen your wife. I haven't either since I was married. I told you this was a parable. You got that part. <laughs> they said, you haven't seen her. No. Um, well, do you write to her? No. Do you telephone? No. You haven't seen her? And you're married? And I said, yes. I got up in front of the witnesses and I said, I do. And I have a certificate here to prove that I'm married. They said, you better check on that. <laughs> Ten years ago, some people said I do to Christ and were baptized and they got a baptismal certificate to prove it. What have they done about it since? I believe in once saved, always saved, as long as I keep saved. And to keep saved means that the relationship goes on because we pay attention to the things of relationship, communication. It rips my heart out when I think of those who have discovered discouragement and heartbreak and disappointment because during this shaking time some partner went cold when you wanted to stay on God's side. But please, my friend, keep close in relationship with the one who is the author of all love. And he's made provision to more than make up for the unfairnesses of this life. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, we pray that you will teach us how to value those elements of relationship with you that make the difference. 
Teach us better how to pray, we ask. Teach us better how to study thy word. Teach us how to contemplate the love of Jesus. Lord, take away from us anything else that would undermine that day by day. And thank you that you were the one that initiated the whole plan in the first place. Thank you that we have been reconciled. Help us this evening to accept it once more. And then guide us that our relationships with you will be strong and whatever relationships you have in mind for us with each other will be strong because of that. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus.